I am. All right, let's go ahead and just hop right into it. So I got, I'm gonna start off with a bit of a fun story, which starts off with a bit of a not so fun question. Now this is not a question for a response, it's a question for you to think about throughout this message. And that is, how desperately do you want God? How desperately do you want God? Now the reason I'm thinking of this question is actually because of a very not so serious story. You see, recently, I think it was Tuesday, I was having a bit of a weird day emotionally. And I was talking to some friends and they're like, you know what, how about we go watch the sunset at some docks out in Clemson, it'll be a great time. I'm like, all right, whatever. I was feeling a little bit under the weather, so I kind of had to drag myself over there and I'm like, all right, this is weird. But then we got there and it was beautiful. As we went to the docks, my first thought was, man, I would love to jump off of these things. <laughs> And uh, not, not in like that way, like, I'm okay, don't worry. <laughs> but I looked at it and I was like, wouldn't it be fun just to like, boom, you know, just take, go for a swim. And I said it out loud and immediately Ainsley was like, I was just thinking that. <laughs> and so we were like, all right, you know what, let's go. I'll be like, I'll do it if you do. She's like, I'll do it if you do. I'm like, all right, whatever. Phones out of pockets, shoes off, get the countdown. We run in, right? We get a head start. I jump off. I go and flip around, give a peace sign to the camera. And then I hit the water. And it didn't last long. But for a little over a second, I was fully submerged in water. And the only thought on my mind was I need air. Now, I was in no dangerous situation, but I realized when I was fully submerged underwater that I desperately needed air. <clears throat> and in that moment, I was willing to do anything to get it so I go to the bottom have my feet touch the floor and I jump off to get some air at the top and I walked out and I thought I would have done anything to get air in that moment because I knew how much my body needed it to live how desperate then am I for God at any hour of the day if in that moment I was that desperate for air, which my body needs, then how in tune am I with my spirit and my soul to feel how desperately I also need God at every hour of the day? There's something to think about as we continue on with this message. But I'm going to go ahead, and I want to go ahead and paint the picture here. We're going to be painting two pictures in the form of a chart or a graph. I know this is not, this is no kind of math class. So don't worry, I'm not grading you on this. But did anyone see the movie Buzz Lightyear? Yes, or like the Lightyear movie? No. You didn't see it? No one saw it? No. This proves my point. This is perfect. How many people saw the trailer and was like, yeah, I'd go see it? Did anybody think about seeing it or like thought that they would see it? No. No? No. But we have a few people who are like, yeah, I would have considered seeing it. And that's what a lot of people thought. A lot of people saw the trailer and they considered seeing it. However, it did horribly in the box office. Why? Well, think about it like this. We're going to go, go ahead and try to make a bit of a graph for you, okay? And I'm going to call this the hype chart. Or you could use like the excitement chart, anticipation chart. This is how excited people were for the movie. So when the, when the teaser came out, people were like, oh, that might be cool. And then the trailer came out. They were like, oh, I want to see this. And it's at the peak where you see like Marvel movies. This is when you release the movie, when people are most excited for it, right? Right at the top. However, the movie Lightyear got struck with something called production delays. And so when it was supposed to come out here, it ended up being moved back here. And so people were still excited for it, but the excitement went down a little bit. And right before it was about to come out again, there was another delay. So by the time the movie actually came out, the anticipation and the hype chart, as I'll call it, went something like this. It went up and back down. And then it came out. It ended up doing really badly at the box office. Now, the only thing I need you to keep in mind is keep in mind that chart where the excitement goes kind of like this. And then when it actually comes out, it's kind of way down here. Does that make sense? We kind of see that visually a little bit? Perfect. Now let me paint a different kind of a picture. I want to paint a different kind of a, a hype chart, if you will. And I was actually talking to Ainsley, and we were talking about a murder mystery that she heard on the radio once. 
And she was like, oh my word, I heard this story. Me and my dad followed this thing for like two years, right? Because they were so invested in it. Now, if you think about it, whenever you hear a story like a murder story on the news, how long does it stay in the news cycle? Does anyone have like a general guess? A week. It's like maybe a week. It's like maybe a day. Like maybe three days, maybe a week. But like after a week, like no one's talking about it, right? But these two were so invested. They followed this story for two years. So let's paint a different kind of a chart here. We have the hype and anticipation. It started off right here when they started listening to it. Then they looked into it and it was right here. And two years go by and they are constantly checking for updates. And their anticipation, their excitement stayed up here the entire time until eventually, boom, they solved it. What a satisfying end to that. With all of that built up anticipation and hype. All I'm trying to do is paint two different kinds of pictures. So we have the first one, where it kind of went like this, and then plateaued off, right? Then we have the second one, where it went like this. But it stayed, because she was still excited and invested and wanted to know more. Then we see the two pictures here, the two different pictures. Good. This had me thinking. <laughs> is there some kind of a hype to heaven sometimes? Or is there some kind of a <laughs> hype chart that we could make about how enthusiastic we are about our faith, in a way? Or like, when we first accept God, maybe it's kind of like right here in the middle. And it's like, oh, you know, heaven sounds cool. I'll call it the heaven hype chart this time. But then we learn more about it, and we're like, oh my word, heaven sounds awesome. And it kind of goes up here. And then we get into like the day-to-day -day of life. And the further we go, it kind of starts to go down a little bit. Maybe something happens and it goes down a little bit and it keeps going. We keep going throughout our day to day and it kind of goes like that a little bit. Similar to the Lightyear movie hype chart where it kind of it, it, it spiked, right? But then in a way it kind of went back down again. Now for me personally, I'll tell you what this looks like for my life and maybe you can relate. But if I was to make a heaven hype chart for my life, I think it would look a little something like this. It would kind of go up and down. But, but then it would go back up and then eventually it would go back down and up and down. Because I've had seasons where I'm really excited about the gospel. And I got my eyes locked on him and I just want to grow closer to him. It's going up. But then, you know, maybe something happens and my life, my season changes and I have enough time to read the word. But then I go to college, I'm like, oh my word, this is amazing. But then the more I go into college, it's like, you know, things are normal and I kind of lose sight. Does anyone else kind of, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think for yourself. Does anyone else's heaven hype chart maybe like that, where it just kind of, there have been seasons where you're excited, but it kind of goes like this. And so I have a question for you. How long are you willing to be excited about Jesus? Maybe, let me say it a little bit differently. How long are you willing to keep your eyes on Jesus? How long are you willing to focus on Jesus? Now, if we were to make our ideal heaven pipe chart, I think our ideal one would look more like Ainsley following the news story, where it goes up like this. But then we maintain that excitement and that anticipation and that intrigue, right? And so we maintain that. We keep going, and that's what's constant. How long are you willing to focus on Jesus? With that in mind, we're going to go ahead and go into our reading. <laughs> now, this is a story that everyone's heard before growing up. I've actually got two different passages. Here's the first one. Now, let me go ahead and give some context. Jesus has made it to Jerusalem, which is the place where he gets crucified. And he knows that it's coming up. And so he tells the disciples, I want to withdraw to a place where I can pray. So he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he prays the Lord's Prayer, right? Or he prays that prayer where it's like, Lord, take this from me. Right? And he tells his disciples before he goes, please pray and stay watch, right? But you kind of know what happens. So that's the context. That's the context. Let me go ahead and just dive right into it in Mark 14, 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. 
My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, Jesus said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Hmm. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Now watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> now I kind of read this story and my first response was, Peter, <laughs> Peter, what are you doing? He said, stay, watch, and pray. And he went along for like an hour, it says, because you not stay up for an hour. Jesus goes away for an hour and he tells you to stay watch, but he falls asleep. And I'm like, Peter, what are you doing? Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I was a disciple, I would have stayed up 100%, right? Anyone else? No, maybe not. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, if you factor in how long they had journeyed and how much sleep they had probably gotten the past few nights and how tired they really were. Hmm. You know, I said something a few weeks ago, something along the lines of, we blame Adam and Eve and we judge Adam and Eve for sinning, but we do it every day. And I think in the same way, we look at the disciples and we're like, how could they fall asleep? Yet, if we look at our pipe chart, we've had seasons in our lives where we could probably say that we've done the same thing. Now, <laughs> here's something that I found that was interesting that might bring a little more clarity to the message. You see, Jesus tells them, watch and pray so that you will not fall asleep. Wait a second. No, sorry, it doesn't say that. It says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Think about that. Watch and pray, not so that you don't fall asleep, but so that you don't fall into temptation. For the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Jesus tells them, watch and pray. Why? Not so they don't fall asleep, but so that they don't fall into temptation. Watch and pray are two important words to keep from that. But while you keep that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and go to a second reading, a second passage, which shares a few similar characteristics as the first one here. Now, this one's actually a teaching that Jesus gives. It's a bit of a parable that he gives. It's going, it's going to be coming from Luke 12. He's going to be doing a good amount of reading in Luke 12. He's going to be starting at Luke 12, 35. This is Jesus talking to a crowd. He's going to give a preface, then he's going to go into a parable at Luke 12, 35. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes back, and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Now it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and he will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. Now Jesus is trying to paint a picture here. And this, this picture is really interesting because what happens is a master went off to a wedding banquet now a master clearly had servants back at his house but the servants were not sure when he was going to be back they couldn't just call him up they couldn't shoot him a text like hey man when are you coming back tonight they didn't have that so what they had to do is they had to stay at the door so that when they heard a they would immediately open it for him right and so what they had to do is they had to stay watch it says stay watch and keep your lamps burning and so what these servants would do is they would do that. They would stay watch, waiting for their master to return home from the wedding banquet. And here's what's interesting. It paints a first picture. There's a few different pictures, but here's the first picture. It paints the first picture of the servants who stayed watch. The servants who were awake when Jesus, when, when the master came back, sorry. The servants who stayed awake and stayed watch when Jesus came back, it's, or when the master came back. It says that the master dressed himself in servant's clothing, told his servants to recline at the table, and he served them. 
Does that picture sound familiar? Have we seen that general concept played out somewhere else in Scripture that we can think of? Where someone who should have been served actually ended up serving those people. Can anyone think of something? Well, I mean, you did Jesus. say his name twice on accident. <laughs> it was on accident, yeah. Can anyone think of a specific story I might be referencing? But Washington. That's it. The master served his servants. It says that he dressed up, had them recline, and served them. In the same way, the teacher served his students. Or he got an appropriate clothing and then washed their feet. Interesting. You see, that's a beautiful picture. However, that's hardly all what this passage is trying to teach. Because there's a second picture with a different kind of service, and it did not go so well for them. Let me go ahead and keep reading. In Matthew 12, going to be going from verse 45 now. Matthew 12, 45. But the servant says to himself, <laughs> but suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking too long in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and to drink and to get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour that he is not aware of. He will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. Now, to be honest, when I first read this, I almost left it out because <laughs> I didn't want to convict anyone too much. Maybe I just didn't want to be convicted myself. I don't know. But it says, the, master, the servant who knew the master's will and didn't do it will get beaten with many blows. Or the servant who doesn't know the master's will and doesn't do it will be beaten with few. So basically, it's painting a picture of three different kinds of servants. We have the servants who knew the master's will and did it. And what happens to them is that the master actually serves them. That's group one. Group two are the ones who knew the master's will but didn't do it. They get the harshest punishment. Then we have group three, the ones who didn't know God's will and didn't do it. They still got a punishment. Not as much, but they still got a punishment. The question is, what kind of servant do you want to be like? I don't want to be like the first one. I want, I want to, I want to feast. I want to recline, right? I want some food, right? Wouldn't that just be awesome, Jared? I want to be the one that gets the reward. Then are you willing to do what it takes to get it? Because the servants that got the reward are the ones that stayed watch for when the master was to return. Okay, Jared, that's great, but how should we stay watch? How exactly do we do that? Well, <laughs> here's the biggest thing that stood out to me about this passage. <laughs> so in this analogy, obviously God is the master and we are his servants, but I found something interesting. In this analogy, we are servants that run the master's house, right? So the master has a house. We are servants that run this house. So basically, this is God's house. And I thought, I've seen that somewhere in Scripture. Where have I seen a picture being painted of God's house? Wait a second, wait a second. Matthew 21, 13. It is written, Jesus said to them, My house will be called a house of... Someone say it for me. Prayer. Prayer. He goes on to say, But you are making it a den of robbers, which is exactly what the other servants did in this analogy. Isn't it cool how they correlate? He says, My house will be called a house of prayer. Let me go ahead and do something for you. In the first story, what did he tell his disciples? Stay, watch, and... Pray. In the second story, we see that these servants stay watch, but we see Jesus saying that my house will be a house of prayer. Those two 
go together. Stay watch and pray for when the master is to return. And it doesn't say don't fall asleep. It says don't fall into temptation. How do we not do that? We pray. How do we keep our heaven hype chart like this? Where it peaks and then we stay consistent up here. Where we continually stay excited about Jesus. They watch. We pray. Let me go ahead and close with this. Going from Luke 12, kind of in the middle of the two passages that we read. Luke 12, 39. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Let me ask you a question that may sound familiar. How long are you willing to keep your focus on Jesus? Because to me, the only right answer seems to be as long as it takes. And you might not be there at a point where you can honestly say that I will for as long as it takes. And if you're not, you may want to be thinking about that. Because how long are you willing to stay focused on Jesus? That's what I got.